I have the privilege of introducing Nolan Williams. Nolan Williams is uh, assistant professor in my department, a physician with both neurology and psychiatry training, brings the richness of both fields to really important questions in neuropsychiatric and neurological diseases. And um, he's going to talk about the demise of the asylum and the rise of interventional psychotherapy, talking about the really radical shift in psychiatry that you're witnessing. Come on up, Nolan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to you uh, today about um, a shift in uh, how we're conceiving of treating individuals with neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, I uh, put this historical painting uh, there on the right. So this is a, a painting of uh, Philippe uh, Pinel, who's the, thought to be the father of modern psychiatry. And this is in the uh, late 1700s, where he was freeing uh, psychiatric patients from being handcuffed and chained for having the behaviors they had that got them uh, into what is now called the Salpetriere uh, Hospital in Paris. So I'll give you a brief history of uh, psychiatry and neurology, introduce this concept of interventional psychiatry, and highlight some recent advances uh, coming out of my lab. So we've, um, we've had a rich history of studying brain diseases, and there have been a number of uh, places and times that have transitioned the way that we view these problems um, one of those times, one, one very important time, was a time around a uh, neurologist by the name of Jean-Martin Charcot, who was uh, uh, thought to be the, modern, uh, the father of modern neurology and called the Napoleon of neuroses. And uh, Charcot ran a hospital in Paris called the Salpetriere. And in the Salpetriere, all neurological and psychiatric uh, conditions were, um, uh, individuals with uh, all neurological and psychiatric conditions were housed there. And many of the advances that transitioned us from thinking um, that many of these conditions were uh, either intentional or related to demonic possession or any of those things, really transitioning these ideas into uh, brain diseases happened at the Salpetriere. And what's um, particularly important is that Charcot was the um, teacher of many of the modern um, uh, neurologists and psychiatrists that uh, proceeded forward after him, including Freud, uh, Babinski, uh, Gil uh, de la Tourette, and others. And he, uh, he really shaped this idea of there being a, a structural underpinning of these psychiatric conditions and studied things like hypnosis. And really this transition from uh, jailing individuals with psychiatric conditions to really studying it and under, understanding the underlying neurobiology started in this hospital. And what was particularly interesting was the idea of brain stimulation started uh, in this hospital. So if you see the zoomed in picture there, this is uh, one of the first brain stimulation devices. The larger painting is of Charcot hypnotizing a patient that had a diagnosis at that time of hysteria. And so um, about 100 years later, Hans Berger uh, developed a neurotechnology called the EEG, or encephalo, uh, encephaloelectrogram. Uh, and in that uh, device, he uh, showed that people with epilepsy actually had a trackable signal coming out of their brain. So you could record an epileptic seizure, show when it started, show when it ended, and it transitioned uh, what was thought to be a psychiatric condition into one that's thought to be a neurological condition. And we've used the same technology for over 100 years and really introduced this idea that you can take a stigmatized condition, whether it be epilepsy or more recently things like uh, mental illness like OCD and depression, and you can develop a brain technology that allows for you to track that phenomenon and once you do that, you actually destigmatize it and turn it into a medical illness. And we've seen this over and over again. Every time uh, we have a condition in which we don't understand, it's in the psychiatry kind of uh, realm. It's, it's not uh, understood. And as soon as we have a brain technology uh, we can use, we turn it into a medical illness. So this is an example um, uh, of, of such a technique. On the, on the left, um, this is kind of a... Uh, 
uh, hierarchical cluster, uh, hierarchical um, uh, nested hierarchy of, um, of complexity. And uh, psychiatry is really focused uh, over the last 100 years on the phenomenological aspects of, of uh, mental illness. And then in the last 50, really focused on what's going on in the synapse. And I would argue that in the, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've really shifted towards a circuit-based understanding of psychiatry, one that uh, we share with neurology, and we can actually speak a common language. So this is, to the right, this is an individual uh, receiving deep brain stimulation surgery for um, a severe OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder. And we have an, a recording electrode in his brain uh, what you don't see is a video where I gave him a sterile uh, toothbrush, and uh, the brain activity was essentially silent during that time. And this is a guy who had pretty severe OCD, such that he would uh, throw away a toothbrush once a year, I mean, once a day, uh, every day, all year long, uh, because he was uh, afraid of the contamination. So we introduced the toothbrush into the uh, non-sterile side of the operating room, and showed that we can actually induce the obsession um, and record it in the brain. So this is kind of the fundamental idea that you've got this unknown, uh, phenomenologically characterized illness, you introduce a neurotechnology and you transition into something that you can record and measure and understand. And so what you hear is you hear kind of this low level baseline firing As my uh, colleagues behind the uh, curtain, uh, Casey Halpern and Kai Miller, um, on the sterile side of the operating room, this is me on the left corner, and uh, give the gentleman a uh, contaminated, perceivably contaminated toothbrush, put it in his hand, and we're recording in the brain, in somebody who is, uh, um, got an electrode in the nucleus accumbens or the pleasure center of the brain, which processes pleasure but also processes people having compulsions and obsessions. And what you hear and see is increased firing in that area. And what I would um, challenge you to think about is actually to do what the epileptologists do and flip the thinking about what this is. So it's not a, f a disorder characterized by a bunch of um, phenomenon, clinical phenomenon, but rather a disorder characterized by misfiring in a circuit, and we see it as a, as a clinical phenomenon, right? And the more technologies that we can develop to show these sorts of things, the more that we'll understand them. So um, to kind of transition to, so, to work we're doing and a, kind of a pragmatic focus we have, um, U.S. suicide rates, as many of you know, are on the rise. Um, in, at the same time, psychiatric beds have fallen. So uh, several groups have shown that this rise in suicide rates and this fall in available psychiatric beds have occurred at roughly the same time. There's no current durable, long, um, uh, uh, rapid-acting anti-suicide intervention that's available. So if somebody comes into the psychiatric hospital, they actually, it's the only place in medicine where you reduce the number of options that you have. And so, you uh, go into the hospital for a heart uh, arrhythmia, you actually increase the number of options you have. You could maybe get uh, invasive monitoring, you may end up getting a pacemaker or something like this, but in psychiatry, you actually lose some options and a lot of what we're doing, which is important to protect people, is keeping them there and keeping them safe, but there's not been uh, an intervention developed to actually rapidly treat and, and sustain that treatment uh, outside of the hospital. And as many of you know, suicide is a, an immense societal cost, um, and it's, it's uh, comorbid across all major psychiatric conditions. The uh, standard antidepressant medications, as many of you know, take six weeks to work. Um, we don't know for a given individual which one to give, and, um, and that's compounded by the problem that uh, the highest incidence suicide risk for any individual is within the first 30 to 90 days post-discharge. So if you're admitted to a psychiatric hospital for your first psychiatric admission for suicide, for suicidal thinking and depression, your highest risk is actually in that time right after you leave. 
We've got um, therapies that work, like uh, electroconvulsive therapy, but the problem uh, there is that uh, most people uh, don't elect to do it. So they, uh, for a combination of uh, not uh, being available in a given hospital, the stigma of doing uh, ECT, this is a picture from one uh, flew over the cuckoo's nest, which a lot of people will talk about as being uh, um, kind of the, the fear they have because it was um, uh, kind of not given a good light in that movie, and the real risk of, uh, of cognitive dysfunction that results uh, from ECT. And so only about 2% of people in the United States end up getting ECT that meet criteria to get ECT. The other um, option uh, for treating uh, individuals rapidly is a, a drug called ketamine, which many of you uh, may have heard. The issue there is that uh, it, it doesn't last more than a week, so you would have to really continue to infuse somebody once a week with this drug, which causes a lot of psychomimetic effects, um, to maintain the response. And uh, research that we, we recently published showed that uh, this is working through an opiate system. And so uh, it's concerning because uh, in the context of an opiate crisis, we're gonna uh, potentially give an opiate-related uh, drug. So uh, neuropsychiatric conditions are conditions of distributed neural networks, dysfunctional distributed neural networks. Um, these are what we would call neurological conditions on your uh, left and psychiatric conditions on your right. But what's interesting, and I highlighted this in green or blue, uh, the, the green conditions are ones that you can actually see on pathology post, uh, post-mortem, so you can actually confirm diagnosis there. But the, the blue ones, whether it be all of the psychiatric conditions or also Tourette and uh, uh, generalized dystonia, these are conditions in which there's no uh, pathological diagnosis post-mortem. So you can't see this in the brain uh, at the level of, of um, uh, conventional microscopes. What's also interesting is that um, we have kind of four major health crises going on uh, in this country right now. So the suicide epidemic, depression, opioids, and chronic pain, and they all seem to localize to the prefrontal cortex, and they all seem to respond to opioid-type uh, drugs, uh, not necessarily in a long-term way or in a good way, but acutely that, uh, that appears to be the case. And so maybe uh, what we're actually dealing with isn't an epidemic of a given phenomenology, but an epide epidemic of a prefrontal dysfunction and some people with that prefrontal dysfunction will manifest it as depression. Some people will manifest it as opiate uh, dependence. And in fact, people that have depression have a 2.4 times higher opiate use in a post kind of knee surgery or something like this, uh, day three, compared to people that are uh, not experiencing depression. And so this idea of transitioning from jailing people with mental illness to putting people in, um, in asylums to uh, identifying abnormal signals, tr um, stimulating or treating those abnormal signals, normalizing them and sending them out of the hospital is one that I think that we're approaching um, over the last 10 years. And so traditional um, RTMS uh, is a, uh, is an intervention that's been approved since, 19, since uh, 2008. It's been explored since 1995. It involves using a two Tesla electromagnet and depolarizing cortical neurons, making the brain fire and fire in the, uh, the area that I showed you earlier, in this left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. In this case, 3,000 times a day uh, for 40 minutes, roughly a day for six weeks. And that's quite useful for outpatients. It treats about a, uh, fully treats about a third of people. Uh, eliminates half of, uh, of, of the symptoms in about half of people, but it's not something that we could really do uh, in a wide scale uh, in a hospital because of the bed shortages and the, the speed in which we have to uh, get people out of the hospital and well. And um, more recently, a friend of mine, John Downer, and his group showed that intermittent theta burst, which is a three minute uh, stimulation approach, is non inferior. Uh, to 40 minutes of traditional TMS, who instead of sitting there for 40 minutes in a chair, you sit in the uh, chair for three minutes, once a day, every day for six weeks. What we've, um, and that's a kind of a zoom in of this stimulation approach, the, the reason why um, people use this data burst approach is because it's highly efficient and it's able to be 
uh, applied in a much shorter period of time. The other way to think about it is could we give an entire uh, course of TMS each day? Could we give uh, a very potent amount of TMS over the course of what is uh, less than the standard duration of a psychiatric hospitalization? So in a five-day window, can we do this? And so we've been exploring this idea, applying this very efficient theta burst multiple times a day, um, using things like space learning theory, so uh, allowing for a certain time interval in between each stimulation session and uh, making a rapid uh, intervention, so trying to get people well very quickly. And what we found is, is that about a third of people are well at the end of, of the first day, and by the end of it, about 80%. And so this idea of being able to really apply a lot of stimulation very safely in a short period of time is possible, and it appears to be safe. There's no cognitive dysfunction after this, and if anything, the brain uh, expands in time. So this is just a single subject, or if you can see the, the kind of not that much in the way of dark blue all the way to dark blue, and this is uh, the amount of cognitive, kind of cognitive control um, in the system. We've also, uh, kind of inspired by Charcot, have tried to, in, uh, in, in our piloting data, uh, shown that we're able to move this neural trait of hypnotizability, the ability to receive suggestion, and use TMS to actually push that, to create a, a transient uh, new human neural trait. And so the question is, um, should we care? Have we changed our minds? We are still imprisoning mental illness. At least many of the people in, uh, in jails uh, have psychiatric conditions. Much of what we, uh, we imprisoned 200 years ago were things like Tourette, things like epilepsy, that because we have a neurotechnology, those people don't go to jail, right? They go to the hospital. But I think that as we develop new neuro neurotechnologies, we're gonna be able to transition more and more people out of the system and identify them early. And so maybe the asylum looks a lot more like an epilepsy monitoring unit. And maybe the new Salpetriere will happen here. Thank you.